It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Most Christians are intimately familiar with a few basic metaphors the Bible uses to depict God. King, shepherd, physician, and judge. Author Lauren F. Winner sees the value in these metaphors, but while studying the Bible, she discovered hundreds of other metaphors which Christians often overlook. Metaphors that can make us more aware of God's presence in our daily lives. God is like clothing, bread, a woman in labor, laughter. God is a friend. Discovering new ways to think about God helped her recover from a spiritual dry spell, and she explains some of her favorite discoveries in the new book, Wearing God, Clothing, Laughter, Fire, and Other Overlooked Ways of Meeting God. She writes, I hope this book will help you sit down with God in a place the two of you have never visited before. Winner's writing has been praised as wise and lyrical, winsome and erudite. Her books are informed by uncertainty and infused with faith. And in this episode, Winner discusses a few fresh ways believers can imagine God by making use of biblical imagery. It's Lauren F. Winner talking about the book Wearing God in this episode of the Maxwell Institute Podcast. Questions and comments about this and other episodes can be sent to mipodcast at byu.edu. Lauren F. Winter joins us today. It's a pleasure to have you on the show, Lauren. Thanks for having me. I'm excited. I thought we would begin by talking generally about your own background. You have a really interesting um, spiritual biography that you talk about in a book called Still Notes on a Mid-Faith Crisis. And it seems like wearing God is an obvious outgrowth of your spiritual biography. So go ahead and just talk about uh, your background a little bit. So um, I grew up Jewish in North Carolina and Virginia. And When I was 21, I was baptized in the Church of England. I was a graduate student at Cambridge at that time. And I don't have, you know, one of those dateable conversion stories. I can't tell you that I became a Christian, you know, at 10.03 in the morning on January 2nd, 1999 or something like that. Although I would say that baptism is a dateable thing, right? And a significant, you know, was I a Christian 10 minutes before I was baptized? Uh, That's sort of a complicated question of baptismal theology. But there was a several years process that, um, that led to my decision to be baptized and to join a church. And so that happened when I was 21. And I was just completely, completely, completely fired up about the whole thing. I was about the, you know, you've heard that phrase, the zealous convert. I was about the most zealous convert you can imagine. I was super into um, learning about the church and learning about sacraments and learning about church history and learning about the creeds and so forth. Um, And I felt, I felt a, a pretty profound intimacy with Jesus. I mean, I felt like Jesus was right there and we were intimately connected. And, you know, because I was 21 and didn't really know much yet about how life worked, I assumed, well, this is how it will feel forever. You know, I've had this, this conversion process that was in some ways, in some ways quite wrenching and dramatic to, to move from being an observant Jew to being a Christian. And it was, it was, even though it wasn't like a, a one-off dateable conversion, it was a, it was a dramatic thing in my life. And I thought, okay, well, I've had this one wrenching, um, profound, dramatic, beautiful, complicated religious experience. And now for the next 80 years, I'll just have more of this, more of this intimacy with God all the time, enthusiasm about the church all the time. Um, of course, that's, that isn't what happened. Um, and anyone who's older than 21, you know, knows that that can't possibly be what happened. So I had this intense sort of convert zeal for some years. And then, um, and then I reached a um, season in life where I felt quite alienated from God. And before you do that, talk Mm -hmm. really quickly about what church life looked like up to that point. So you had that zeal. What, how did that manifest in your actual actions? Like how often did you attend church? Uh, What was that like? So I joined the Church of England and was living in England for two years. And then I came back to the U.S. and went to the Episcopal Church and was super involved um, in my local church life and began began a formal process of discernment for ordination to be ordained to the priesthood in the Episcopal Church. Um, 
And uh, it is an interesting sort of intersection that this that this feeling of kind of alienation and estrangement from God um, roughly coincided with the time that I was in that discernment process and was entering seminary. So I was completing a PhD in um, focusing on American religious history, and then I was going off to do an MDiv, and I was writing books of sort of contemporary Christian spirituality and you know, pretty much everything in my life externally and internally was engaged with the church and with church culture in some way. And that's and when you so, hit that wall. Yeah, right. And so, you know, I think um, people who have had these seasons of becoming estranged from God, there is usually some autobiographical way of explaining it, though maybe not always. I mean, in my case, I can say, my mother died, my marriage was foundering, this was all sort of deeply confusing and unexpected. Um, so in some way, that's, that's a correct account. There were these autobiographical circumstances that, um, that intersected and in some ways may have provoked this season of feeling alienated from God. But I think the autobiographical explanation is never fully adequate because I don't think that these seasons are ever fully about us. They are about us and they are also about God. And we know, um, we know from the scriptures, particularly the book of Isaiah, uh, in which God is described as the self hiding God or the God who hides himself. Um, we know that this is actually a quality and characteristic of God, that God is mysterious and that God does sometimes hide or withdraw. And then when you look at the whole history of Christian spirituality, the whole the whole history of Christianity, you can begin to see that there is actually, um, there's actually a sort of pattern or choreography in the Christian life. And this is part of it. In other words, it's not, I think when one comes to these seasons where one is experiencing God's alienation or your own alienation from God or God being alienated from you or withdrawn from you, when you come to those seasons of encountering God's hiddenness or what seems like God's absence, um, it's I think it's never just about the fact that you had a, a a personal crisis. It's never just about the fact that you lost your job and are thrown into turmoil. It is also, I think, somehow about God's own mysteriousness and God's mysterious freedom to withdraw from us um, as God as God wishes. Of course, we also can withdraw from God, right? We can persist in sinful behavior or persist in kind of actively hardening ourselves against God or turning away from God. And so these seasons are about us and can be about us, but I think they are also about some mysterious piece of, of God's own being and God's nature. Some people might look at that and say, well, perhaps it's just the case that um, you stopped being able to convince yourself that, that there was a God. And, and that perhaps uh, this is an indication that um, belief in God itself is the problem. Did, did you run into that at all or any feelings about um, wondering if God was ever there to begin with or anything like that? Yeah, I had those feelings. Maybe I've made the whole thing up. You know, maybe this is all maybe this was all just something I needed in my, you know, teens and 20s and I don't need it anymore. Um, I had those thoughts. I, I, I think that. um sort of ineluctably, I am a God person. And it is, it's, I have been, a, I haven't been a Christian, obviously, my whole life, but I've been um, curious about God, I think, my whole life, even as a child. And I didn't, I didn't grow up in a family where that was an expected thing or where we were taught really anything about God or where curiosity about God was like a valued characteristic. So I think I've just always naturally been curious about God and curious about the things of God and how, how to meet God. So yes, I did have these momentary, maybe I've made all this up, but I think uh, I'm, I am wired or the Holy Spirit ha has, has chosen to interact with me in a particular way such that um, I can't actually sustain those questions for very long. So even when I even when I really felt that God was utterly absent, it wasn't, it didn't feel like, oh, proof for atheism, you know? <laughs> right. Um, you, you mentioned how you 
kind of undertook a study of past Christians and and found this choreography where uh, a dance with God, where God withdraws and comes back. Um, maybe you can expand a little bit on the relationship between your scholarship and your personal religious faith. That's an interesting question, and it's not one I have a a kind of crisp and concise, well formulated answer for. I think, um, I think to for me, um, study of of Christian theology, study of church history, um, sort of formal study of the scriptures, all of that feels of a piece with life with God. Um, and I understand that not everyone will necessarily feel that way. And of course, in the Christian spiritual life. You know, the Christian spiritual life is full of diversity, and there's a, a, a real abundance of different ways of seeking God, of different ways of loving God, of different, way, different ways of getting yourself in a, in a position to hear from God. And, of course, no, no one person, you know, if we think about prayer, there are all different kinds of prayer disciplines and prayer practices, Lexio Divina, you know, silent prayer, contemplative prayer, liturgical prayer, conversational prayer, no one person is going to be drawn into all of the different kinds of prayer practices that have emerged in the in the life of the church. And, and so even more broadly, um, not everyone is going to be called, you know, uh, to a life where the primary way that they are interacting with God is service. Some people's Christian lives will be really marked by service is the primary way they interact with God. Um, so for me, study is is one of the key ways that I love God. Um, and I think of, of, of course, the key passage, the hallmark passage from Deuteronomy, where Israel is commanded to love God and commanded to love God in several different ways, one of which is love God with your mind. Um, so not everyone in the in the life of the church will will have study as a central piece um, of their friendship with God or of their spiritual lives, but for me, it always has been. So, for people who want to hear um, a little bit more about um, that 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 difficult period of of time in your faith life, um, I really recommend that book. It's called Still. Um, in this book picks up a little ways after that. It seems like you had come around to a, a new place with God by the time you were writing the book Wearing God, uh, which is the one we'll talk about uh, through the rest of this interview. And one thing that was interesting is you you say that Scripture was kind of your avenue back or that Scripture provided a way for you to reconnect in, in a surprising way. So talk for a moment about that. Yeah, so somehow, despite the fact that I spent my entire life in Jewish and Christian communities, um, which is to say communities in which the scriptures are held up as the word of God and as the most abundant place where God's revelation, you know, is, is, is offered to God's people. And although in both of those communities, communal engagement with the scriptures and personal individual study of the scriptures is very much uh, valued and encouraged, somehow... Um, somehow I, I didn't totally get the memo on that. I mean, I knew theoretically that I should be reading the Bible, <laughs> but I just didn't actually read it very much. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I found the Bible sort of boring, uh, which seems sort of like a strange thing to say and feel, but I found the Bible sort of boring. And, you know, I try, I, I was in a Bible study for a while and it just didn't really, it didn't really quite take. And, you know, I would go to church and I would listen to the scriptures being read in church, but like I would sort of try to listen, but I would also sort of daydream and wool gather. Um, and then about five years ago, I rather suddenly became, it was like a, 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 a switch got flipped. I became rather suddenly completely enamored of the scriptures and for the first time, I really began to understand what what people meant when they said things like, you know, the Bible was a place where God was totally alive for them, or that in engaging the scriptures and engaging the word, they felt 
you know, really alive to God and to God's presence. I began for the first time really to understand that. It had never really made sense to me before when people had said that. So, I mean, there were a couple of things going on in my life um, that I think helped awaken me to the scriptures. One was that I, I sort of by accident stumbled onto to a practice, and I write a little bit about this in Still, and I write a little bit about it, actually, I'm wearing God also, but I sort of accidentally stumbled onto the practice of, of reading the scriptures in an unusual geographical location, <laughs> which is now a practice that I try to pursue uh, weekly. And, you know, the logic of that practice is we're so, so accustomed to reading the Bible at home or maybe reading the Bible like at a friend's house, if we're in a small group, or maybe reading the Bible in church, um, then there are then nine million and three other places in the world where we don't read the scriptures. And, and I think that where you read um, changes how you read. So that if you take the scriptures to a, a strange or unusual location, which is to say basically anything other than your house or your church, and you read the scriptures in that location, um, then you you become available to certain possible meanings or certain readings or certain interpretations that otherwise you really wouldn't be available to. So I, I sort of stumbled into that practice and that was very awakening for me. Um, I think another reason that I got kind of hooked on the scriptures is that I was uh, beginning to teach classes in a in a women's prison in Raleigh, and I was teaching them with a Baptist pastor who is one of the most re- interesting readers of the Bible that I have ever had the privilege to be around. And so, listening to her, um, listening to her engage the scriptures, and also seeing how the scriptures flourished and were fruitful in her life, I think was also part of what. Um, kind of finally got me curious about the Bible instead of feeling sort of like the Bible was boring and alien. So you had different reading practices, and then you also had people that you were connected with who kind of showed you um, new ways to read, right? That's, right, um, exactly. I'm speaking with Lauren F. Winter. She's an assistant professor of Christian spirituality at Duke Divinity School. She's also an Episcopal priest. Her books include Girl Meets God and Still Notes on a Mid-Faith Crisis. Her most recent book is called Wearing God. This is a book about the metaphors that we use to describe God, the metaphors that have been used uh, throughout Christian history. I think that um, an important aspect of your book is how it's attuned to the fact that we usually come to know God uh, in a community. And so your personal relationship to God can really be impacted by the people that you worship with. And the crux of your book is the idea that we end up imagining God using familiar images and pictures and metaphors. And you use this really interesting example to illustrate this idea. You talk about a blue Turkish bowl, and I thought maybe that would be an interesting uh, segue into the book itself. Um, So I write in the introduction and the conclusion to the book um, about what it's like to go to a museum, um, particularly like a huge museum, like the Metropolitan Museum of Art or, you know, the National Gallery. And that you you can hang out in the museum, you can spend all day in the museum, you can go to the museum and sit for three hours looking at one, you know, one painting, or I say in the book, one one blue Turkish bowl, and you can sketch the bowl, and you can meditate in front of the bowl, um, and then you can leave the museum and tell tell your friend all about the bowl that you hung out with for three hours. <laughs> And you can maybe even mention the other three paintings you looked at and you can talk about the fabulous, you know, mozzarella and pesto sandwich that you ate in the museum uh, coffee shop. But that that's a very partial description of the museum, right? You it it might be a pretty good description of the bowl, maybe. um, But it's a very partial description of the museum. And. um, And that, I think, is part of what scripture understands about the task of speaking about God. There are, I think, actually countless 
images, metaphors, tropes, um, kind of baskets of figurative language for God in the Bible. There are just many, many metaphors and idioms that the writers of scripture use to, to try to say something about their experience with God and what they know of God and who they know God to be and who they know themselves to be in relationship with God. And every single one of them is like a description of a bowl at the museum. I mean, every, every one of those descriptions says something true and illuminating about God, but none of them, even if you add them all up, right, that's not, it's not a description of the museum. It's not finally a description of God. Now, of course, this analogy breaks down, right? The, the usefulness, I think, of the analogy is that it gets at something about God's abundance um, and God's, I mean, abundance isn't even an adequate word, God's super abundance. Um, but of course, finally, you know, God far surpasses the museum. Um, the museum, for example, doesn't give us our being and God, God does give us our being. That's who God is. So, the analogy breaks down, but it is actually precisely in the breaking down of all of these analogies that I think we learn something about God. So, so all of the figurative language in scripture for God is illuminating and has some, some really rich um, invitations to offer us. I think of, of each of these metaphors as sort of like a doorway and the doorway opens onto a particular path or a different path that we can walk with God and, and it's a path that we walk with God and a path that we walk to God simultaneously. But all of them are also partial and, you know, they, they will kind of break down if you push them, if you push them too far. Um, but that's what I was trying to get at with the museum and the bowl, sort of God's uh, dizzying abundance. And there are a few um, metaphors for God that I think are pretty widely held uh, uh, by Christians, and this is things like God as Father, God as a Shepherd, um, God as a physician. Uh, right. But those are kind of the main ones. That they're, they're uh, I think, um, Christianity in a way has kind of stopped at those. Uh, why do you think that is? Why? Why just? Why pick a few? And why have we kind of stayed well, at that level? I actually don't think it's true that Christianity has stopped at those. I think that different historical moments in the life of the church have paid more or less attention to different images and different biblical passages and biblical metaphors. So I was part of what I loved in doing the research for this book. Um, so in Wearing God, I look particularly at six kind of clusters of figurative language from the scriptures for God. And part of what was fascinating was to see that basically all of these images, even though they aren't images that we pay very much attention to today, um, that in earlier moments in church history, in in some Christian communities, these were really central images for speaking about God and speaking to God and speaking about our relationship with God. And so I think it's um, I think it's interesting that different communities in different times and places in the life of the church will focus in on a handful of images. And maybe that's just human nature, right? Maybe it's just entirely predictable that a community will home in on a few images and pray with those and preach about those and write those into their hymnody. Um, and of course, when you do that, on the one hand, those images become more meaningful they become they become meaningful precisely because they are invoked and used all the time so i i write in wearing god briefly about about the image of god as great physician and i've i've lived a very lucky life um low these 38 years i have not had serious illness and um just if i were to think about my own personal small narrow small life uh, God as great physician wouldn't leap out at me as an especially um, meaningful way of talking about God, or I wouldn't naturally gravitate toward that. But that is an image that I have prayed with, um, and it's an image I've used to pray to God quite a bit in the last 10 years or so 
um, because people in my church have needed God to be great physician. And so that image has taken on more and more meaning because I have prayed with particular people in particular health crises to the God who is the great physician. Um, So that's one thing that can happen when you kind of zero in on a handful of metaphors and images. But then there's a, a less exciting thing that can happen. And that is that the images can become kind of rote, you know, and, and, and one, the person praying with those images can become kind of insensible to them and not really ponder what they mean and, and just sort of use them almost as placeholders. And then you sort of forget about the mysterious abundance that, that they're holding the place for. So all of that was a very long way of saying, I think that on the one hand, um, on the one hand, there's a, there's a richness that comes when you live intimately with a few metaphors for, or descriptions of God, but there's also a danger. And, and I think it's very telling that the scriptures include so very many different metaphors for God. And I think part of part of that very abundance in the scriptures is the constant reminder that we really shouldn't get too comfortable with any one or two or three of these images because none of them will ever capture, you know, the whole of who God is. And we shouldn't restrict when the scriptures don't restrict the scriptural imagination to a few images, then neither really should we in the church restrict our, our imaginations to, you know, just father, great physician and shepherd. That's one of the valuable things about the book overall, I think, is the way that it not only introduces readers to new ways of thinking about God uh, through through different metaphors, but that it also contains its own warning about that very exercise. And, and as you said, it's that idea of almost the risk of idolatry, almost the risk of turning one's metaphor into the object of worship and, and, and not remaining open to a living God who like any relationship, uh, will go through changes uh, alongside a real person. Um, Right. So I think one of the gifts of there being so many of these images in scripture is that, you know, as we were talking about earlier, people's own spiritual lives have different, I don't think I want to say phases, that sounds sort of dismissive, but different seasons. One is, one is going to be in different spiritual seasons at different points And so it's a great gift that scripture gives us different kinds of language, some of which might be more helpful during some seasons than in others. And then, of course, uh, very few of us conduct our spiritual lives in total isolation, right? We are, we are, we are, and I would say we should be members of, of churches and of Christian community. And, and so even if I'm in a season of my spiritual life where some particular given way of of imaging God feels feels like the way, feels like the thing and the the powerful abundant thing. The person next to me in church might be in a season of life where she is praying with a very different um, basket of scriptural language for God. And then, of course, that person and I are in life together and friendship with God together. And so our different ways of imagining God will kind of come up alongside each other. And I think that that church interaction, I think also is a, is a good, um, it's a good way of destabilizing a kind of solipsism. It's a good way of, of kind of guaranteeing that we won't get stuck in our own, just our own preferences, you know? Yeah, right. Uh, That must be kind of connected to where you write. Um, There are plenty of psychological and even medical reasons why our images of God matter. And you also say that there are social and political consequences. That This is the idea that the images that we have of God have real impact on uh, our relationship to God, but also how we worship and who we worship with and, and all of those things. Yeah, I have to say I was completely fascinated in doing the research for this book to discover this enormous social scientific literature, which um, was new to me, obviously to, to many people, it will not be new, but it was it was new to me that there was this huge amount of research um, that that finds correlations. It's it's not it's not easy and it may not be possible to sort of to prove causation, but finds correlations between on the one hand, the image of God that you hold, 
or the way that you image God when you are praying. And then on the other hand, a whole raft of things that, you know, that seemingly would be unrelated to that, like gun ownership, like, you know, likelihood of gun ownership or um, sh- feelings of shame or rates of psychopathology. Um, I mean, just the list goes on and on. So I, I was completely fascinated to learn that there are these correlations between how we image God and then how we live our lives. And, and although I, although it was new to me that there was all this research, when you step back and think about it as a Christian and as a believer, you know, one would hope that there's some correlation between how we think about God and how we put together the sort of quotidian ordinary stuff in our life. If there is no correlation, that actually would seem problematic and confusing. So it was both um, it was both fascinating and surprising to find this literature, but in some ways, it seemed once I once I thought about it, it seemed oh well, that's actually exactly as it should be. Right, um, because yeah, because it has impact on someone's actual everyday walk, everyday life, life experience, and right. I think that also goes to speak on why certain images of of God appeal to different people because everyone uh, has different experiences and and, and um, you bring that to uh, your search for God. So it, it only makes sense that different um, different images. I, I think of Paul's scripture where he says, you know, he's talking about the body of Christ and says, let don't let one member say to the other that you don't have need uh, of you. And that would sort of be similar if I were to object to a certain image of God that didn't appeal to me without recognizing that there are reasons why a particular image of God would appeal to someone else and not to me, and, and, and that that's okay. Right, right. Um, with, with so many different images to choose from, you mentioned that you chose, uh, I think you look at eight in this book, uh, f- um, different kind of areas, uh, friend, clothing, smell, bread, and vine, laboring woman, laughter, and flame. So... I just wondered how you decided on these particular images out of out of all of them that you had to choose from. Well, in a certain way, the book was totally um, self-directed in that I kind of wrote about the images that I naturally gravitated toward. And and when I stepped back, maybe when I was maybe about halfway done writing the book, when I stepped back, I realized um that there was a, a common thread in the images that I was was drawn to. And the common thread um, is that all of those metaphors or images are, are very ordinary. They are connected to our ordinary everyday life. And, you know, when, when you think about some of the images that we talk about more, more often in church, shepherd, king, I mean, those are images that might have been very connected to the lives of, like, first century people in Palestine or Israel. Um, But they're not, I mean, I don't, king is not an image that is connected to my daily life in any way, right? Um, Well, you lived in England for a while. I did live in England, but there was no king. Right. You know, praying, praying to God and picturing God as Queen Elizabeth might be, or Helen Mirren, you know, might be a stretch. Um, (laughs) So I was very drawn to sort of ordinary, quotidian, daily images of God. And upon reflection, it seemed to me that, um, that this, is, this is really part of Jesus's method. This is actually what Jesus did in his own teaching. And I'm thinking here, you know, primarily of the parables, mm-hmm. that he would, he, would, he would walk through an ordinary day an ordinary Tuesday, an ordinary Wednesday, and he would look around and he would glom onto something he saw, something from ordinary life, a sparrow, a woman with her coins, um, men going to get their paychecks. And he would take that thing from ordinary life and he would say to people, you think that this is just a sparrow or you think maybe this is just guys queuing up for their paycheck. But actually, it's much more than that. It, it, it's actually here to tell you something about God and about who God is and about how you can be in relationship with God. And once, once one begins to view the world that way, once you begin to walk through an ordinary day in your life and say, oh, out my back window is a tree. I've always just thought of that as a nice tree. 
But actually, in Hosea, God identifies as a tree. So maybe that tree out my back window is actually here to tell me something about who God is and about who I might be in relationship with God and who I might be as one who bears the image of God. So once you begin to look at your everyday life that way, it's it's transforming, right? It's just totally transforming. So part of my hope for wearing God um, as a book, part of my hope is that when people read it, that they will both come away with a, a sort of renewed curiosity about the scriptures and and maybe a kind of richer palette for imagining who God is and some different images to maybe use in prayer, but that they will also um, come away with a, a renewed capacity to look around their lives and notice that there are so many things in their day-to-day lives that are actually used by the writers of scripture specifically to say something about God. And that means that the invitation, the invitation to ponder God, the invitation to be drawn more deeply into relationship with God is all around us all the time in our ordinary everyday life, which seems to me on the one hand, awesome and remarkable. And on the other hand, um, it seems exactly the strategy that a God who became incarnate would use. I mean, it seems entirely right. consistent with what we know about God, God. God came to live among us for the sake of our relationship with God. And the kind of God who would do that is also the kind of God who doesn't just communicate, you know, in abstractions or something, but actually takes up the normal stuff of everyday life to, to tell us, to tell us what God is like. That's Lauren F. Winner. She's author of the book, Wearing God, Clothing, Laughter, Fire, and Other Overlooked Ways of Meeting God. Um, you, the first chapter, you you explore God as friend, and that was an interesting choice because you write that you weren't really keen on that image at first. That that wasn't something that it immediately appealed to you, right? Yeah, so the, the language of God as friend is deeply biblical. It is found... In the Hebrew Scriptures, and then of course it is um, it is intensely found when when Jesus says to his disciples, uh, "You are you are no longer my servants; you are you are my friends." So it is deeply biblical language. But I I associate it uh, not with the Bible primarily, but with Sam Wells, who was the dean of Duke Chapel when I first got to Duke nine years ago, and this is an image. Um, that Sam really loves, that we are friends of God, that God has given us everything we need to be God's friends. And and when I first heard Sam using this language, it really kind of rankled. I, I found myself thinking this language like borders on being disrespectful. Um, and this may in some way uh, get back to in my own in my own biography, um, kingship language is very important in Judaism. So as a, as a young person, I grew up with a lot of kingship language, and that is language that really emphasizes God's transcendence and God's majesty. And so that's, in, in my own formation, that sense of God's transcendence, that sense of, of awe and of God's majesty is very it's very formative. It goes very deep in me. And friend almost feels like the opposite of that, right? So I would hear this language of friend and I would think, who am I to, you know, call God my friend? You know, God God is the creator. God is my redeemer and the redeemer of all creation. To call God my friend seems kind of cavalier and disrespectful. Um, But it's basically one of my working theories in the spiritual life that when something when something irks you, like when you hear something in a sermon and it really irks you, or when you read something in the scriptures and it really irks you, or you hear a hymn and it really bothers you, um, maybe, not always, but maybe that's actually an invitation from the Holy Spirit to pay more attention to that, that thing that's irking you. Maybe it means the Holy Spirit has something for you in it. Um, and so I thought, all right, friend is very biblical, and Sam Wells, who I, who I respect a lot, is using this language. I should, I should actually try to adopt this language precisely because it kind of bothers me. So, so I have. I now it took a while to get comfortable with it, but I have very much adopted the language of friendship with God, and 
Um, and as I su- suggest in the first chapter of the book of Wearing God, um, it's language that both um, both is used a lot and in very interesting ways in the Christian tradition. And it's also we can learn we can learn about what it might mean by studying how you know great theologians from the past have thought about that language. Um, but it's also, of course, language that we can think about our everyday lives. And I'm I I'm someone for whom friendship is hugely important. And I I know a lot about friendship when I look at the data of my own life or the archive of my own life. And so it can be interesting to just say to yourself. Well, what do I know about friendship? What does friendship require of me? What does friendship give me? What is hard about friendship? What is what is easy about friendship? You, know, you can just sort of easily brainstorm that from your own life and then say, so what does, what does all of that suggest about God? So in my own life, I'm a really inconsistent friend. I love friendship. It's hugely important to me. I'm totally inconsistent at it. I'm not a very good friend. I think that my most of my friends are better friends than I am. Um, I've also, I think, gotten better at it. I think if you asked someone who's been friends with me for 10 years, the person would be likely to say that I'm a better friend than I used to be. I know about friendship um, that if it's really going to be meaningful, it requires a certain kind of honesty. Like there's there's really no point in sort of it's not a great friendship if it's at the level of, you know, small talk and mm-hmm. trying to just present your best self and so forth. Um, I know about friendship that that on the one hand, friendship is sustained by, you know, just liking the person and feeling affection. But also um, friendship is really aided when aided by um by it not having to just to rely on on affection so that when you actually have a common project with your friend when you are teaching in a prison together or when you are planning adult ed at your church together then that means your friendship has something to to rest on beyond just the fact that you like each other so i could keep going but all of that it turns out is also true of my relationship my friendship with god i'm inconsistent i'm not that great at it i think i'm better than i was a few years ago uh, etc. You know, requires honesty, so forth and so on. So, so I think friend is actually a um, as a model for how ref- how it might work, how it might go to reflect on the Bible's metaphors for God. Friend is a, is a pretty good model because we can pretty easily think about friendship in our own life and then say, okay, so what what does Jesus mean when he says we are now his friends? What 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 might that mean? And and I like that you started out with that because, as you said, sometimes the, you might have your initial reaction to uh, to a particular image might be negative or it, it just might not resonate with you. But if you if you push through that, you might find something that you wouldn't have known otherwise. You you talk about this as being a blessed kind of uncomforting or a holy kind of uncomforting. In, uh, and, and I like that. Um, you're inviting people to sit with their discomfort for a little while and right. uh, and see what, what can come out of that. Um, I thought that the start of the chapter on clothing uh, was actually kind of funny. Um, <laughs> you, you talk about your interpret- different interpretations of the story of Eve and Adam in the garden uh, in Genesis, particularly the part where God made garments of skin to clothe them with. Uh, right. That's the King James has that, uh, and and you had a really interesting way of interpreting that verse at first that I, I had never thought about. So, um, talk about how you initially were reading that about God clothing them with skin. So I've of course heard that story even as a little girl in my uh, synagogue in Asheville, North Carolina, and I I just always since childhood I, I always thought that it meant. Um, that's when God gave Adam and Eve actual skin that Hmm. somehow they didn't have skin before that. And then God gave them skin. And I, I mean, I think if you'd pressed me and said, well, what did they look like before? I, I don't know exactly what I would have said. I never really thought about it in that much detail. Wasn't there like a PBS, like slim do good or whatever, that guy with the spandex suit where you see like all of his muscles and stuff maybe exactly right or those um you know those jangly halloween um 
October, you know, skeleton coloring sheets from grammar school, that kind of thing. <laughs> um, and of course, the standard interpretation of this verse, I have subsequently come to realize, is not that God gave Adam and Eve human skin, but that God made them outfits, leather outfits, right? Outfits from animal skin, um, which of course makes a certain kind of sense. Um, I was I was relieved to learn that there is a, a a strain of rabbinic interpretation um, in which uh, the rabbis the rabbis share my view. I suppose I should say I share the rabbi's view, but there is rabbinic precedent for also interpreting the skin as human skin. And in that interpretation, part of what that interpretation is saying is that that it. It was it was only after the fall in some way that Adam and Eve became fully human. Um, so regardless of how, you know, whether one thinks it's human skin or leather suits, however one interprets the specifics of um, of the verse in either interpretation, God is clothing Adam and Eve. And it's it's the last thing that God does before before finally exiling Adam and Eve from, from Eden. It's the last thing that God does before sending Adam and Eve out. And it actually strikes me as an incredibly merciful thing for God to do. Um, and, and I think one can picture God, you know, actually feeling some sorrow and, um, and, and thinking or saying or feeling you, you, Adam and Eve, you do actually have to leave now, but he here's this last thing I can do for you. Um, I can offer you this protective and beautiful garb be before you go. And, and then it becomes, it seems to me, all the more remarkable that when we get to the letters of Paul, when we get to Galatians and Romans, um, that suddenly God is no longer just clothing us God is also our clothing, right? So Paul writes of um, our, the baptized, being clothed in Christ. So it's not just that God clothes us with, you know, leather pants or what have you. God actually clothes us with God's own self. And um, that just seems to me a, a remarkable thing. And, and again, we can, you can just begin to think about what clothing is and does in your own life. That it, um, that yes, of course, it protects you from the elements, but beyond that, it shapes your sense of self in a certain way. It conveys something about you to the world at large. It sometimes, it sometimes creates community, right? This is why I teach at Duke. This is why, you know, on game days, all of the Dukies are wearing their Duke t-shirts, right? It's, it's clothing, marking everyone as part of a particular kind of community, Um in addition to that, um, clothing, and to me, this was, was and is sort of the most startling kind of spiritual piece of this clothing metaphor. Um, clothing is actually quite, it's quite an intimate image. Clothing is very close to us. Um, and I think when we think of how the Bible talks about God, we're pretty accustomed to saying that when the Bible uses family language, kinship language, God is father, God is lover, God is spouse, um, that that language is intimate. And, and that's, that's, of course, absolutely right. That language can be very intimate. Um, but clothing is intimate in a different way, right? Clothing is pressed up against you. <laughs> and it is pressed up against the parts of you that you find beautiful and delightful. And it is, if you're a 38 year old woman who wishes that you weighed a little less than you do, it is pressed up against the parts of you that you're ashamed of. And, and the notion that God, um, that God is that to us, that God is, is pressed close up to us and that God wants to be close both to the parts of ourselves that we find beautiful and the parts that we're ashamed of seems to me, it just seems to me a, a remarkable and profound thing. I, I think that story of, of Adam and Eve perfectly captures that. I want to just quickly read this teeny section here where you say, um, 
God's clothing them is the first disclosure of something we see over and over in the Bible, God's deep abiding interest in working with and for human beings. And you say you found yourself uh, picturing God bending over, stitching fur garments for Adam and Eve. I imagine that God is sad while stitching, and I imagine God's gift as one of utter tenderness. I know you have to leave, but here is one last thing I can do for you before you go. Um, I thought that uh, the chapter on clothing was especially rich. And, and of course, you conclude with the idea that God invites us to clothe others. And, and you tie it into the notion of, um, of serving others and, and caring for other people. That's from Lauren F. Winner's book, Wearing God, Clothing, Laughter, Fire, and Other Overlooked Ways of Meeting God. Lauren is an Episcopal priest, an assistant professor at Duke Divinity School, and an author of several other books about faith. We'll take a quick break and then come back and wrap up the interview. Now that you've already read all of the scripture commentaries that promise to make your scripture study easier, it's time to dig a little bit deeper. Latter-day Saint philosopher James E. Faulkner has written the Made Harder Scripture Study series on the premise that our scripture study is only as good as the questions we bring to the table. The Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University has already published the Book of Mormon Made Harder, the Doctrine and Covenants Made Harder, and the Old Testament Made Harder, and now the New Testament Made Harder is finally available. Each book is filled with challenging questions with occasional commentary to make reading harder, or rather, more fresh and surprising and demanding. These Made Harder books are an excellent tool to improve your personal or family scripture study, sacrament meeting talks, or Sunday school lessons. The New Testament Made Harder by James E. Faulkner is now available at Amazon in digital and print formats. So much of modern life is geared to finding faster and easier ways to do the same old things. The Made Harder series is proof that making things easier does not always make them better. The last image that I wanted to talk about with you uh, people really need to go buy the book because there, there's uh, so much more there than we ever would have time to cover. But this is a chapter about the laboring woman. And this is an image uh, or metaphor of God that you took from Isaiah chapter 42, where it says, For a long time I've held my peace. I've kept still and restrained myself. Now I will cry out like a woman in labor. I will gasp and pant. Talk about that one for, for uh, a little bit because uh, picturing God as a woman in labor is probably one of the uh, less frequent metaphors that, that people might meditate on. Yes, and for me, it has been a profoundly uncomfortable metaphor and image. And um, I've come to realize over the last few years of living with and praying with that image and metaphor that it's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable to me, not, you know, not because it's a female image, um, and not because it's a, a kind of human image. There, there are plenty of anthropomorphic images for God in the scriptures, but rather it is the physical vulnerability that that verse suggests. Now, um, childbirth, labor, is, and I say this as someone who has who has not had a child, but I have done extensive reading and talked to lots of friends, and I am now <laughs> persuaded that childbirth is both an experience of profound strength and at the same time, profound bodily vulnerability. And one thing that's very striking about that image from Isaiah is that in the Hebrew, Isaiah uses three in one verse, three different Hebrew verbs to, to, to say something about the labored breathing, the bellowing, the gasping that God will do in labor. So that's, that's remarkable that there are these three different verbs, you know, that each, none of them just mean I breathed. They all mean a different version of bellowing, grunting, groaning. Um, so the verse is really a soundscape of God's laboring. And, and as I've lived and prayed with this verse and this image, what I've diagnosed in myself is that the discomfort I feel about it, the discomfort I feel when I picture God in bodily anguish, which is like super uncomfortable. I just want God to be in charge, right? And, and, and kind of have it all under control. I do not want to be picturing God in bodily anguish. But of course, there's, an, there's another biblical place which gives us God in bodily anguish, and that is God on the cross. And that my own um, my own thinking about the cross has become sort of sanitized, right? The cross has become a doctrine. 
And so when I, when I think about Jesus on the cross, I don't feel particularly uncomfortable. I don't have a sense of that as God in bodily vulnerability for salvation. Um, and of course, that's exactly what's going on in Isaiah is, is Isaiah is writing uh, to Israel when Israel is in exile. And in this particular passage of Isaiah, uh, God is saying, I am laboring to bring forth new life. Um, so it's very, it's very similar to what we then see on the cross, which is God in bodily anguish, laboring, if you will, to bring forth new life. So for me, the image from Isaiah has begun to to sort of give me the crucifixion again and give me the cross again, not as a kind of sanitized abstraction, but actually as um, as as what it is. Yeah, it's it's a particularly useful one for for some women to be able to uh, think about. Um, there aren't there aren't as many metaphors and images of of God that are particular to the experiences of women, and so I was glad that you spent a chapter on that. I think it's true that that is an image that women, many women, might might have a, an easier time getting to than than maybe some other images. But I do think it's worth noting that we live in a funny historical moment where, on the one hand, there are more women than ever before who, like me, don't have any direct access. I mean, even in even in ancient Israel, if you didn't have a child, you still would have been at lots of, you know, your sisters and your neighbor women's childbirths. So we live in this odd moment where there are more women than there ever have been who don't have direct access to the image. And we live in a moment where because, you know, at least in North America, dad is in the in the in the delivery room, where actually men, many more men than in ancient Israel would have many more men today do actually have some direct access to what this image means. So I, I don't think it's only, you know, a girl's image. Um, and and I think it's it's kind of cool to live in this historical moment where men have more direct access to this image than, than they would have even when Isaiah was written. But I mean, we, we could go on and on, but people will really need to go and pick up the book. Uh, the book is called Wearing God, and it's a book about the metaphors that we use uh, to think about God. And I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the Maxwell Institute podcast today. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me.